Good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, before we uh, hear from the Dutch Council, I'd just like to go around the room and see who's, hi, who's here and welcome everybody. There's some, some new faces. So. Linda Gravel, uh, Democratic Chair for Washington County. I'm uh, Kale Romanoff, Vermont Natural Resources Council and Vermont Conservation Voters. Jen Duggan, Conservation Law Foundation. Yeah. Wayne Fisher, Oracle Media. Uh, Catherine Rose, I'm an LLM student at Vermont Law School. I'm an intern at the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Great, are you getting your environmental your degree, the joint degree? or? Um, it's, it's an LLM in yeah. energy and environmental law. Great. I'm Laura Murphy from the Vermont Attorney General's Office. I'm Megan O'Toole from the Agency of Natural Resources. I'm Rob McDougall from the Attorney General's Office. Pete Hirschfeld from the Mom of Alison Crowley from the Mom of Crowley. Um, Crowley. Uh, it's all good. Kelly McCracken. I'm a popular citizen. Great. Yeah. Heather Schollis with William Schollis and Associates. Luke Marland, Ledge Council. Mike Bailey, our assistant, and Gwen. Uh, Gwen Zacher from Lake of Cities and Towns. Great. Okay, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so we are uh, starting with um, addressing climate change, uh, 688. Hopefully everybody has either a hard copy or access to it. Um, this is a little different from, from what we've been doing, but that's the great thing about the Judiciary Committee. So, so Luke, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Luke Marland, the Director of Legislative Council, the Chief Counsel of the General Assembly. It's good to see you. I'm here today to walk through of H688, as the Chair indicated, and in particular focus on a section that establishes a cause of action. And what I've done is prepare a PowerPoint. Uh, it might be easiest for you if you simply look at the PowerPoint on the screen. It's meant to give a structure to the presentation and highlight some key points. I don't think you need to follow it on your laptop or iPad. And instead, I would suggest you just listen along. Please always ask questions. But when I get to specific text of the bill, uh, maybe you have that on your iPad. And I can tell you what page to look at. And you can read along with me. So I'd like to begin by giving a very quick overview of how the law works. And um, this is high level. It's not referring to the text of the bill. If you want more detail, if there's any questions, please interrupt me. So this bill would, first of all, establish mandatory greenhouse gas reduction requirements. In Vermont law, currently in 10 BSA 578, there's goals. And this converts them to mandatory reductions that must be achieved by the state. And they're pegged to three different years. For example, in 20. 25, the state must reduce greenhouse gases 26% or more compared to 2005 levels. By 2030, the state must reduce greenhouse gases 40% or greater compared to 1990 levels, the 1990 benchmark. And by 2050, reduce by 80% compared to 1990 benchmarks. So there's three benchmarks or stages of reduction that are now mandatory under this bill. Secondly, the law establishes a Vermont Climate Council that will have 21 members. Some are from the executive branch, some are experts in different areas, uh, some represent different constituencies or points of view. And this Climate Council has different duties, but the most important one is to prepare the Vermont Climate Action Plan. And the idea is that the Climate Council will meet and look at science and data and discuss, and there might be subcommittees, for prepare an action plan. The action plan gives the overview or the overarching plan for how the state will accomplish these mandatory greenhouse gas reductions. So this is a plan for the state to achieve those required reductions. That is, according to the bill, supposed to be developed by July 1st of 2021. And the next stage is rulemaking authority that is currently vested in ANR to promulgate rules to achieve the plan, to carry out the specific strategies and objectives of the plan, but also to achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas reductions that now will be in Title 10. So you have council, prepare a plan. Once a plan is prepared, a&R engages in the rulemaking process to give life 
to that plan and to achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas reductions. I'm sorry. So yes, this is the this is the um, the tie into the legislature at this point, and then after that, the authority goes to the Climate Council and A and R. Sort of. So really, what you're doing is you're um, setting the structure, mm -hmm. as it's shown on the screen, and then you're in essence delegating authority to NR to promulgate rules to achieve the goals of the plan and to achieve those reduction requirements. So we could technically override them, but at this point we're setting something in motion that yes. if we left it undisturbed would go through without another legislative. That is accurate. It doesn't preclude mm -hmm. you from taking action. And there are certain things that you must do and only you can do. That doesn't change. It's a rulemaking authority similar to what you've conferred to other agencies and departments mm -hmm. many, many times. So you are correct. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I review the rulemaking process and the role of LCAR, which often comes up as a question. So and the LCAR uh, is the? Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. So thank you. So a &R promulgates rules. And then finally, and this is what I'll focus on today, is there's a section that gives a cause of action in case that rulemaking process breaks down. Either rules aren't promulgated or rules are promulgated, but they're not achieving the mandatory greenhouse gas reduction goals. And so what we'll talk about today, what we'll focus on is those last two green boxes, the rulemaking process and then the cause of action set forth in the bill. Before I go on to begin to go into the more detail on some of these issues, are there any questions so far? Thank you. So what I want to focus on today is two sections of the bill. Um, the first is the new 10 BSA 593 that gives some detail about ANR's rulemaking <coughs> obligations. I don't plan to read this section of the bill, but just give you an overview of it and then to talk about the cause of action, which we will in a few moments read and discuss in detail. So pursuant to 593, ANR is obligated to develop, to promulgate rules that are consistent with the specific initiatives, programs, and strategies set forth in the action plan. And if you remember, the council develops the action plan. To also achieve the mandatory greenhouse gas reductions, and in doing so, ANR is required to develop and file, and we'll talk about the process in a moment, file a detailed record of its process and its decisions. And this record goes beyond what is already required for most rulemaking. ANR is also required to conduct public hearings as it develops its proposed rules. And we'll talk about the stages in that in a moment. The timeline is that its rules to um, achieve the 2025 reductions that I just mentioned have to be promulgated by 2022, to achieve the 2030 reductions by 2026, and to achieve the 2050 reductions by 2040. And there's also a required mechanism when ANR comes out with its rules to implement the plan to achieve those benchmark reductions, and then every couple of years it goes back and reassesses its rules and it can modify them or change them if necessary if the rules that it had promulgated are not uh, achieving the required reductions. So for example, you'll see that 2040 develops the rules to achieve the 2050 reductions. There's language that every couple of years it goes back and reassesses whether those rules are on track and can update or modify them as appropriate. 594 is the section of the bill that is the cause of action. That's what we'll focus on today. It is written under two different scenarios, and I'll be the first to admit that those scenarios are a little, there's probably some gray area in them, but as I introduce it to you, I'll talk in terms of two different scenarios just to make it a little easier, but in reality, there might be some overlap. The first scenario is that a &R fails to engage in rulemaking. So if the bill becomes law, a &R is required to engage in rulemaking, it just it doesn't do it. Or what it does is so obviously deficient that it's not carrying out the plan for achieving the greenhouse gas reduction. That's what I call scenario A, and that is set forth in subsection A of this part of the bill. The other scenario is that ANR does engage in rulemaking in good faith, but those rules, for whatever reason, aren't achieving the required greenhouse gas reductions. And we'll talk about that in some depth. 
Now, what I'd like to do today is before we get into the specifics of these sections, is provide you some background on the standard rulemaking process in current law, the role of LCAR, and then also talk about remedies under current law. In other words, if there's no cause of action language in this bill, what remedies, if any, would still exist? And then drill down on what's in the bill and how it's different than current law. So let's begin before I jump into the rulemaking process. Any questions on what I covered so far? Is it all relatively clear? I know it's a lot. I know I'm talking fast, so please interrupt if anything's unclear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's talk, uh, I guess, some background on the rulemaking process. Vermont's rulemaking process is set forth in Vermont's Administrative Procedures Act, which is in Title III, Chapter 25. Um, remember that this bill is exclusively a Vermont law. There's no federal Climate Change Solutions Act. In a lot of areas, there's a state law and a somewhat similar federal law, or there's a federal program that the state is implementing, so there's some crossover with federal administrative procedure law and state administrative procedure law. In this context, we're talking about a state law that has no federal direct counterpart. So we're talking about Vermont's Administrative Procedure Act. As background, in Vermont law, rules have the same force of a statute that you pass. So it's the same force of law. There is no implicit rulemaking authority vested with an agency or department. You have to confer that authority. And in this bill, that authority is conferred on ANR. And rules cannot provide for penalties, fines, or for that matter, fees that are not authorized in statute. Or for that matter, taxes that are not authorized in statute. In addition, a rule cannot enlarge or expand the authority of an agency or allow an agency to issue permits or licenses unless that is also authorized in law. So those are some of the big picture guardrails as to what a rule can and cannot do. So for the rulemaking process, there's a numerous stages set forth in Title III. Uh, first, the agency pre-files a rule with the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules, ICAR, as it's often called. That is an executive branch committee where the members are appointed by the governor. And the purpose of ICAR is to review rules for consistency with the governor's policy and objectives and law. So really, ICAR is an executive branch committee that looks at rules before they go to the next step. It's not legislative, it's executive branch. Next step is the rule be filed with the Secretary of State, and the filing has to include various information, including an analysis of potential economic and environmental impact, the, uh, the text of the proposed rule, any scientific information that underlies that rule, statutory authority for the rule, and explanation of why the rule is necessary. And if you have dealt with LCAR, you usually get a very big stack of documents. That's what's required under this file. In addition, remember, under this bill, a is also required to go further and develop a detailed record of the basis of its rules and file that with the Secretary of State. So under the bill, a is, is required to file even more than is normally required. Did you have a question, Madam Chair? Um, oh, I'll hold it. Yeah. The Secretary of State publishes notice of the proposed rule on its website and in print, and then the agency begins to hold public hearings and is required to provide a reasonable opportunity for parties and stakeholders and members of the public to submit comments and data. Um, how many public hearings are held sometimes depends on the complexity and the interest in the rule. So there's a requirement to hold some public hearings. There's usually a plan to maximize public input. If it's a complex, uh, controversial rule, there might be more public hearings or more public input. Next, the agency will file the, um, I'm sorry, after holding the public hearings, the agency will file the proposed rule with the Secretary of State and with LCAR, with the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. 
So at this stage, they've had the public hearings, they've gotten public input, they may have incorporated some of that or changed that. They're now filing the proposed rule with the Secretary of State and with the legislature. The legislature reviews the rule, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then, after that process is finished, the final rule is adopted by the agency, and it eventually will become effective. So that only happens after the LCAR process, and we'll talk about the stages of the LCAR process in a moment. There's also a ability under Vermont law to do emergency rules. Um, usually they're only um, appropriate if there's an imminent threat to health or safety or some other emergency situation. I don't think that applies in this case. So we talked about the general way in which rules are suggested and then the public <coughs> hearing and then finally adopted. Now let's talk about the process for the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. So LCAR uh, can approve a rule. It can approve a rule with modifications that it's agreed upon in a back and forth process with the agency or department. It can also take no action on a rule. And it can object to a rule. But the basis for objection is limited. In other words, LCAR cannot object just because it thinks the rule is bad policy. There's only seven grounds upon which LCAR can object. And they include things such as the rule goes beyond the authority of the agency. It may be contrary to legislative intent. It's arbitrary, which we'll talk about later, which is a defined term. Uh, the agency failed to maximize public input. The rule wasn't written in the correct style or the economic and environmental impact statements were not sufficient, were not carried out in an appropriate manner. Those are the only grounds upon which LCAR can object to a rule. So once again, it can't object to a rule just because it disagrees with the policy set forth in the rule or the decisions made by the agency or department. Now in actuality, there's often a back and forth in which the people on LCAR may express their opinion the agency may modify the rule accordingly. So often there's a back and forth and modifications to the rule. If LCAR does object on one of those seven grounds, it can recommend that the agency amend or withdraw the rule, and then the agency can, I'm sorry, is required to respond to that objection. And the agency may revise the rule. It does not have to. The agency may revise the rule, or it could withdraw the rule. But once again, it does not have to. And if the LCAR objection is not withdrawn, LCAR can certify that objection, but the rule can still be adopted, and this is important. So the agency can proceed with its rule as written. LCAR, if it decides to certify its objection, all that does is switch the burden of proof in a subsequent uh, court case. So LCAR can't prevent the agency from promulgating the rule. Its certification, I'm sorry, its objection only switches the burden of proof at a subsequent case. And we'll talk about grounds upon which a uh, rule can be challenged in court in a few moments. But for example, if there's a case that alleges or contends that the rule is contrary to legislative intent, normally there'd be presumption that it is indeed in accord with legislative intent. If LCAR had certified its objection on that basis, that presumption is switched. So the burden of proof is switched. But that's the impact of an objection, nothing more. Is that clear to everybody? Good. I want to now give an overview of some of the remedies that are available under current law. In other words, if this bill proceeds, but the cause of action language is taken out, so there's nothing new or different in the bill, what if M if any remedies currently exist for someone to challenge a rule that's promulgated by ANR. There's five current remedies under current law. One, you participate in the rulemaking process. And remember that I mentioned that not only are there required stages for the rulemaking process to meet those, to meet those benchmarks of mandatory greenhouse gas reduction, but there's also every few years, ANR is supposed to go back and assess if the rules are on target, and then they can look at the rules again. So parties, people, interest groups could participate in the rulemaking process if they think the current rules are not adequate. 
under 3 VSA 80. Oh, um, and what's the what's the timeline by which ANR could would be required to revisit those rules? So there is that public process. There are the benchmarks I mentioned earlier that uh -huh. um, let me just go back. So they're supposed to have the those are the reduction years 2025, 2030, 2050. Right. And um, here you'll see that by 2022 is supposed to have the rules to meet the 2025 reductions, 2026 to meet 2030, and 2040 to meet 2050. But under the statute, every few years, supposed, I think it's every two years, right. you're supposed to go back and reassess. I see. So yes. there'd be an opportunity to participate on those benchmark years, but also when they go back and reassess to give input. Okay, thanks. All right. So that's what would happen if if uh, somebody couldn't meet the requirements, it would go back there, they'd reassess to see if it's realistic to meet the goals. So a and R promulgates its rules. Yeah. Um, if they promulgate the rules and for some reason, uh, two years later they look and the rules aren't having a sufficient impact, they're not achieving those mandatory greenhouse gas emissions reductions, they should reassess and modify those rules to get back on track to achieve those reductions because a lot of this stuff will fall on municipalities to go and follow this, so correct? I don't know what the rules will contain. The rules, I, I don't know what the rules will contain. So the rules might impact municipalities, that could be very reasonable. They could impact different sectors. It, it's, I, I can't give you more specifics at this point. It's possible there might be an obligation for municipalities to do something. Okay, thank you. Sure. So there's participation in the rulemaking process. Secondly, under 3 VSA 806, a person can try to start a rulemaking process. A person can submit a written request that an agency adopt a new rule, amend a current rule, or repeal an existing rule. This is in current law. So this is a mechanism for people to have input if they do not like the rules that ANR has promulgated. Third, under 3 VSA 846, the person can bring an action based on a procedural failure in the rulemaking process. For example, a failure to file with the Secretary of State, as I covered earlier. Uh, a failure to file a rule with card. I can't believe that would happen, but if they fail to do those procedural steps, you can bring a case. These first three options I'm not going to focus on. I'm just giving them to you as background. The next two options are the ones I want to discuss and give you more detail concerning. The next option is to file an action pursuant to Rule 75. This is, I'll call it a action under mandamus, and I'll explain that in a moment. That's an action to compel ANR in this case, or any governmental official or entity to carry out a duty that they're obligated to do under, under law. And then last, and I think most important, is a declaratory judgment action under 3 VSA 807. So these last two options are the ones I want to focus on. Just very briefly as to the other, the other prior options that I don't think are as important, I just wanted to point out that I mentioned under 3 VSA 806, a person can submit a request to develop a rule or amend a rule or repeal a rule. The agency must respond within 30 days. If it, if it doesn't do so, it must respond within 30 days. Now let's talk about the Rule 75 action under writ of mandamus. I just explained the writ of mandamus. It's a judicial action to compel a state official or entity to carry out a duty it is obligated to carry out under law. So this is a scenario where a &R under this bill is required to develop rules, to promulgate rules, and they just don't do it. They're just not carrying out their job. You could proceed under Rule 75. This, I know it's a little small, a little dense. I tried to highlight the most important parts about it. This is under current law. So under current law, this is a cut and paste of Rule 75. It replaces the so-called common law writ of endamus, but it does the same thing. So if you notice, this provides the opportunity to take action for a failure or refusal to act by any agency of the state. That's the bold text under A. The mode of review. The complaint and summons will be served upon the agency and parties in accordance with another rule of civil procedure. It includes a statement of the grounds upon which the action is being brought and shall demand relief 
that the plaintiff is seeking. Under time limits, the time in which review may be sought shall be provided by statute, except that if there's no time limit specified in statute, the complaint shall be filed within 30 days after notice of any action or refusal to act upon which review is sought, within six months after expiration of the time in which action should reasonably have occurred. I'm emphasizing this because we'll talk about the time limits under the bill in a moment, and they're different. This is under Rule 75. Then there's language about trial or a hearing. I think in almost all these actions, and you certainly should hear from the Attorney General's office, this would be a judicial, the judge would make the decision. I, I don't think it would be a jury trial. But under certain circumstances, that might be an option. And then review by the Supreme Court. That appeal is to the Supreme Court of Vermont. So it would be filed in Washington County, appeal to the Supreme Court of Vermont. Once again, this is Rule 75, existing rule of civil procedure in Vermont law. Are there any questions about that? The other potential remedy that I wanted to mention is, as I said, the declaratory judgment action. So this is under 3 VSA 807, and it entitles an individual to bring an action as to the validity or applicability of a rule. The action for declaratory judgment will be brought to Washington Superior Court if it's alleged that the rule or its application interferes with or impairs or threatens, et cetera, the legal rights or privileges of the plaintiff. That's somewhat broad language. This is the vehicle pursuant to which a rule can be challenged and pursuant to which these rules developed by NR would be challenged if the language concerning the cause of action was taken out of the bill. I want to talk about the standard review that would be imposed under this statute. Did you have a question? I mean, it seems inevitable that certain um, rules are going to interfere with what people are doing because that's the point of the rule sometimes is to stop behavior that shouldn't be happening or encourage another behavior that needs to happen. So I, th I think you're right. So as I said, it's sort of broad language. I, I think certainly if this bill goes forward and the cause of action is taken out, I think you probably could proceed under this existing law. Yes. So <clears throat> not to get into the language yet, but maybe we'll comment on it later, but there seems to be a savings clause. I don't know if that, I guess. You are correct. I want to mention that later. Yes. Okay. All right. yeah, so you are absolutely right. correct. And that's important. So this so. can come back. And it absolutely can. Okay. Right. And if I, that's, I'll get to that in a few moments. Okay. If I fail to fine. please raise it, that is an important point. So these are the remedies under existing law. Are there any questions about anything I've covered so far? So under existing law, what are the grounds under this uh, section 807, existing law, what are the grounds for the court to invalidate a rule? It could be that it exceeds legislative authority. It could be contrary to legislative intent. I think the most relevant would be this standard, that the rule is arbitrary, unreasonable, or contrary to law. Now, arbitrary is a defined term. It's defined in a separate statute. And I want to read you or summarize for you that definition and talk to you briefly about some relevant case law. So arbitrary is defined as meaning there's no factual basis for the decision made by the agency. The decision made by the agency is not rationally connected to the factual base asserted for the decision. Or the decision made by the agency would not make sense to a reasonable person. This is the definition of arbitrary in 3 VSA 801 sub 13. This definition also refers to two Vermont Supreme Court cases. One is called Byers, and one is called in RE town of Sherbar. And these cases are important. I want to read you some language from that. In the uh, Sherborne case, it states that the court needs to determine whether the board acted arbitrarily. In doing so, the court must decide whether the decision makes sense to a reasonable person. So the same language I just read to you. And even if the reviewing court might have weighed the factors differently, that does not mean it's arbitrary. Because the court recognized that the entity making the rule has wide discretion over what weight to give to individual criteria and what conclusions to draw from them. 
And so long as the decision of the entity making the rules are consistent with legislative and prior agency policy, that rule is probably valid. So even if the record of the board's proceeding contains conflicting evidence, the board's findings will normally be upheld. In the buyer's court, the Vermont case, excuse me, in the buyer's case, Vermont Supreme Court noted that the court will not and should not substitute its judgment for that of the rulemaking body. So I summarize some of that language from the cases because, as you can tell, it's a fairly high standard. There's deference given to the rulemaking body. So even if the court disagrees with how certain factors should be weighted or considered, if the ultimate decision, if the ultimate rules of the rulemaking body seems to be consistent with law and is reasonable, that rule will probably be upheld. What this means, as far as proceeding under Section 807, is if there's a claim that ANR's rules are somehow unreasonable or not or are arbitrary or not rationally connected to the objectives ANR is trying to achieve, that it probably will be a detail, a case that requires um, detailed evidence. And, and in other words, it's a deferential standard review, so the court may have to really drill down as to the basis for ANR's decision. It may require expert testimony. It may require uh, quite a detailed record as to the basis for ANR's decision. So not only is it deferential standard review, but if a case is actually brought, it might be a complex case to, uh, to adjudicate, to litigate. Yeah. Can, can uh, such a review be limited to the record? Uh, how does uh, Vermont state courts handle that? Because I'm not certain about that, so I don't want to try to answer because I'm not entirely sure. I think maybe that would be a better yeah. question for the Attorney General's office. Okay. And pr presumably, if we wanted it to be based just on the record, that could be done out of that. Something if that is different or necessary, you can always add language to that effect. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Any questions about what I've covered so far? Because I'm about to jump to the actual bill and the language in the bill and then point out how it's different than existing law and existing rules. Any questions so far? So let's look at the actual language of the bill. And I want to actually read you some of the text from the bill. I don't know if you have the, the proposed bill up on your iPads or copies. If you do, we are jumping to page 20 of the as introduced version. Uh, it is section four, I'm sorry, 594, cause of action is the line three. Is everyone with me? Great. So I want to read you the beginning uh, subsection A and then Pause, then maybe we'll do subs then we'll do subsection B. Once again, it's divided under A and B, and there's slightly different scenarios, but as I indicated earlier, there might be some crossover between them or some gray area between them. So A on line four. Any person, <clears throat> and person is defined very broadly, it could be a natural born person, you or I, it could be a legal entity, it could be an organization, may commence an action based upon the failure of the Secretary of Natural Resources, in other words, ANR, to adopt or update rules pursuant to the deadlines in Section 593 of this chapter. So that is a scenario where ANR has not promulgated rules, or they promulgated rules and they failed to update them as required by the law. One, the action shall be brought pursuant to Rule 75 of the Rules of Civil Procedure in the Civil Division of the Superior Court of Washington County. So it's pulling in Rule 75 explicitly. Two, the complaint shall be filed within one year after expiration of the time in which ANR was required to adopt or update rules. <coughs> However, a person shall not commence an action under this subsection until at least 60 days after providing notice of the alleged violation to the secretary. In other words, ANR. Three, if the court finds that the secretary, in other words, ANR, has failed to adopt or update rules pursuant to the deadlines, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules. 
If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to update or adopt the rules, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. A couple things to point out about this language. It pulls in Rule 75, but the time periods are different. And under 2, a person cannot commence an action unless they give notice to a &R. The remedy, if the, if the court finds that a &R has failed to carry out its duties pursuant to law, the remedy is that the court enters an order directing the secretary to do so. However, if the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to try to meet the deadlines, it may grant the secretary reasonable time to do so. What would be a, what would be a reason that ANR had not met the deadline set forth in the bill? Maybe the public engagement uh, process takes much longer. Maybe there's uh, many more comments. Maybe they've gone to LCAR and there's a back and forth. Maybe it's tough to achieve all those stages I went through earlier quickly and the process slows down and they weren't able to promulgate the rules on time, but they're really trying hard to meet the time period. The court could look at that and perhaps give them an extension of time to do so. You'll notice there's no mention of damages in this text. So the remedy is the court ordering a &R to carry out, to, to promulgate the rules. There's no mention of damages. Okay. So it, it says, you know, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules. But then, you know, if uh, the court finds the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to adopt or update rules, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. So it's not required. That would be, to some degree, at the discretion of the court. The extension is discretionary. You're absolutely correct. Thank you. And the court would have to weigh whether the NR is really taking prompt and effective action to meet those deadlines that it was trying hard. Any other questions? I guess I'll just, for the sake of it, what would be considered a reasonable, reasonable period of time? That's not defined in this uh, bill. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's therefore left up to courts to figure out. Um, I think courts often play with those concepts. What's reasonable? What's prompt? What's effective? I think courts often play with those concepts for familiar doing so. But it's not defined. There's no rigid time period, for example. And I mean, might that be because so so that then there's the op the option for this to be case sensitive for judicial dis Absolutely. discretion. So if there's like a meaningful um, impediment to having adopted the rules, that would provide a different window than if it was clearly just like. I think that's a valid point. Inattentiveness, yeah. It's always case and fact sensitive or specific. Mm -hmm. um, also, this committee is very familiar with the role of the judiciary and that they play with concepts like what's reasonable or burdens of proof. So I think you're familiar with that in many statutes. And that's what courts often do in various cases. So as to the language I just read, which is under subsection A, how is it the same as or different from Rule 75, in other words, existing law? So as I mentioned earlier, this part of the bill refers and pulls in Rule 75. The time to bring the action is a little different. Under Rule 75, it's 30 days um, after notice or for failure to act six months. Under the bill, it's one year. So it gives a longer period of time than under Rule 75. There's a notice provision I just mentioned to you that the plaintiff has to give notice to a &R before they commence their action. So the question might be asked, well, it's not substantially different than Rule 75. Does it change anything beyond the timelines? And I think that's a judgment call for you and the other committees that may take up this bill. There is an argument that including this language in the bill gives certainty that you could proceed if, to, to bring a cause of action. Um, it doesn't leave any ambiguity. By putting in the bill, it makes it clear that you could proceed on this basis. There may be an argument, I'm not sure about it, uh, as to standing and necessity of showing particularized harm. That would have to be shown in any cause of action, but including the language in the bill may make it clear that this is 
uh, that you can proceed on these actions, it may uh, confer standing. Yes. So <clears throat> the language about the prompt and effective and reasonable period, the, that's not in Rule 75 either, or is that just generally what a court would do for a challenge uh, on a deadline type case? Uh, good point. So that's not in Rule 75 either, that that's unique to this. <coughs> that seems to, to be probably one of the more important components of this. That's a valid point. Yeah. Could you say that again? Well, under Rule 75, uh, if somebody brings a case under Rule 75 because of a failure to meet a deadline, uh, it's not clear to me whether the court can decide to extend that deadline. Uh, if there's, and we've given a rationale for doing that here. And I think that's a pretty important difference as well. It certainly makes explicit that the court can do something. Yeah, it makes very, it explicit. The court might do that anyway yeah. in its equitable powers, but mm -hmm. it makes it explicit. Any other questions or comments? So let's jump now, let's proceed to subsection B of the cause of action language of the bill. So I want to read to you subsection B. This is still on page 20 of the as introduced version. We're starting at line 20. B says any person may commence an action alleging that the rules adopted, there's a cross reference to another section of the bill, on line 21, have failed to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions required pursuant to, and there's a cross reference. Under one, the action shall be brought in the Civil Division of Superior Court of Washington County. Two, the complaint shall be filed within one year after the Vermont greenhouse gas emission inventory is published. This is important, the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, you've all heard of it, it's an existing law, it's published periodically, but it may not be published till two or three years after these benchmarks. It takes a time for ANR to process the data, to get the data, to develop the report. So there's a lag, or there could be a lag, between the year you're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and when you actually know how much those emissions were actually reduced. For example, they came out with the latest version, I think it's referring to 2016 data. It's a couple of years delayed. So, so in this language, you're referring to when the inventory is published. And it might be a couple of years after the year you're looking at. Is that clear to everybody? So that really narrows the window of being able to address it, given the delay in not the delay, the length of the process to get them published. Well, right. it gives you more time to bring an action under this language. So it gives you more time to do that. As far as knowing if you're meeting the benchmarks, yes, there would be a delay. And I don't know if ANR has, gets interim data that can point the way to how they're doing. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So under two, the complaints filed within one year of the inventory being issued. Uh, and that inventory indicating that the rules adopted by the secretary have failed to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions pursuant to, and there's a cross reference. I'm now on line nine. The language continues. However, a person shall not commence an action under this subsection until at least 60 days after providing notice of the alleged violation may not. So that's a notice provision similar to what we just covered under A. Three, I'm now on line 12. If the court finds that the rules adopted by the secretary are a substantial cause of failure to achieve the emissions reductions, proceeding to line 15, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules that achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements. If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to comply, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. So a couple things about this language. Number one, the court needs to find that the rules are a substantial cause of failure to achieve the mandatory greenhouse gas reduction. Two, just as we did under A, the court then shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules to achieve those reductions. And third, similar to A also, if the court finds that the secretary is making prompt and effective efforts, they can grant an extension of time to do so. So some of the language is very similar to A, but the substantial cause of failure language is different. 
Substantial cause of failure is not a defined term in this bill, but once again, I think courts look at things like substantial and they weigh these factors, and it would be, as someone pointed out, very fact-specific and case-specific. Each cause of action might be different. Any questions? Yeah. Can you just do a like a scenario, just because I'm so. Because here's kind of what I'm wondering: What if I'm not saying this would ever happen, but what if a secretary of this department or commissioner um, didn't do anything until the final? stuff came out and was published, and of course they're going to be behind because they didn't do anything, and then they go to court showing that they are doing something, so they sort of got an extension. <laughs> well, two answers to that. First is I think you always assume that agency departments will make a good faith attempt, sure. and, and that's a legitimate assumption. So you often give rulemaking authority to an agency or department to carry out the specifics of some objective that you've established in statute, and you assume that they'll do it in good faith and as quickly and as well as they possibly can. So Even that's always the so. The resources that they have. Well, resources is another okay. issue. Okay. That's valid, okay. too. Secondly, well, you're talking about a scenario A, where they haven't done it. They're just sitting in their chair and they're not even trying to promulgate the rules, or the efforts they make are so de minimis, it's no way they could get to those greenhouse gas reductions. That would be a cause of action under A, and you don't need to wait as long. But assuming they did promulgate the rules, but right. still didn't then, I mean, the deadline to promulgate is not much before that first okay. benchmark that they have to meet. So it could be a teeny tiny bit of time that they have. And so they're going to have to be like ready to go as soon as it's approved. Or finalized, right? I, I, I think there's validity to your point of view. There might be a narrow window, okay. so that's, that's accurate. Okay. And, and one, just be clear, you might not know the impact until a little bit later if emissions are really being reduced. But then somebody might get an extension. It's, it's possible. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, I don't maybe you are planning on covering any less. Just what is the scope? of the relief that the court can order? Well, this is so good question. And this is under both A and B. The scope of relief is not awarding damages. It is, and we'll talk about attorney's fees and costs in a moment, but not damages. It is to enter an order directing a &R to carry out its duties, either to promulgate rules if they haven't done it, or to promulgate new or improved rules if the rules they have promulgated aren't achieving the emissions reductions requirements. That's the relief. But can the court uh, tell the NR what those rules should be uh, to help achieve the emissions gas? So as it's currently written, good question. It is to tell NR to, in essence, do its job or do its right. job better. You know? But um, how specific that order could be is not addressed in the language of this bill. So if if I didn't want the court to get into figuring out how to deal with the emissions and such, uh, is there a way to tighten this language a little bit to make that a little clearer? That really it's it's up to A and R to get the job done, uh, and it's up to them as the experts right. to figure it out. It, you certainly can attempt to tighten this language, and there very well might be a way to do so. I, I think. What Representative Milan is, is getting to is, could the court order that ANR with great specificity adopt this rule, this rule, and this rule? There's nothing in the language that precludes that. Whether that realistically would happen, I don't know. But you certainly could try to add language to prevent that. And let me leave it at that. Any suggestions on what like, that language would look like? Or should I ask the other witnesses? Or uh, do you have any other uh, ideas of how we might do that? I, I do. I think you should definitely ask the witnesses who litigate this area. They might have good ideas also. That'd be, if, if, you, if the court, if the committee <laughs> wants to add language like that, I'm sure we could draft language sure, sure. that would achieve that goal. Well, Absolutely. yeah, and that, from the other witnesses, yeah. I certainly like to hear the pluses right. and minuses of yes. how far we let the court go in ordering the remedy. I certainly want to hear from the services. But, but if you want to try to narrow it, I'm 
sure we could get you there. So when, when you were discussing Rule 75, mm -hmm. um, I don't remember you talking about attorney's fees. Uh, did I? I did not. You're correct. And I, off the top of my head, don't know uh, if or, or how attorney fees would be imposed. I'll tell you about the, what's in this bill in a yeah. moment. So I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I'm, uh, okay. I'm just not sure if, it, if this is different from what is currently there. Okay. And I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. Shall we move on then to, it's now C, I'm on page 21 of the, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me just make sure that I cover all these, I think I did. So this is the differences from B that we just went through and current law, a declaratory judgment action. Um, there's differences as to the time period to bring the action. The difference, as I indicated earlier, is based on the emissions inventory. Um, so arguably, also as the second bullet point here, the language in the bill is perhaps more limited than under existing law, under Section 807 action, because there's a requirement that the rules be a substantial cause of the failure to achieve those reductions. That's what the court has to find before it tells ANR to change its rules. And there's a prompt and effective, basically, extension language that's in the bill. So is everyone clear on those two points? Okay. So let's talk about attorney fees, and then let's talk about the catch-all, which was raised earlier, which is an important part of this bill. So under C, this now talking about attorney fees, it says, if an action brought, in an action brought pursuant to this section, a prevailing party or substantially prevailing party, and I think you're familiar with this concept of substantially prevailing party. It could be a multiple causes of action. You win some, you don't win others. You still substantially prevail. Uh, there may be a resolution that achieves your goals without going all the way to trial or a um, verdict. So substantially prevailing is a concept that's in a lot of um, in other statutes, and I think you're familiar with that. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So a party that prevails or is substantially prevailing. Number one, and now on the top of page 22, the plaintiff who prevails or substantially prevails shall be awarded reasonable costs and attorney's fees unless doing so would not serve the interests of justice. So a plaintiff who sues a &R will get costs and attorney's fees unless the court finds that this does not serve the interests of justice. And this phrase, not serve the interests of justice, is something I think you also may be familiar with has been commonly used in, um, in this context of judiciary, and it gives discretion to the judge to decide if for some reason those fees should not be awarded. Under two, if the prevailing party or substantially prevailing party is the defendant, that's a &R, they may be awarded costs if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law or fact. So if a &R wins, it prevails or substantially prevails, they can be awarded costs, not fees, costs, but it's up to the court. It's not mandatory discretionary. If the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable <coughs> basis in law or fact, and that's based on so-called Rule 11 language, which is both state and federal standard for a frivolous action. So it's tracking concepts the court should be familiar with. So there's obviously a difference between what the defendant gets and what the plaintiff gets, and I'm just wondering if you can either give me an example of why um, a court might not award it because it isn't meeting the um, interest of justice, and or why doesn't it say if the plaintiff has a frivolous or lack of reasonable, like why isn't it congruent? So defendant and R may get right. cost if the plaintiff's action is frivolous. That's right. what two says. Um, what would not serve the interest of justice? I can't give you a specific example. That's discretionary to the court. It's similar to language in other contexts. So. Okay. And now I want to proceed to the catch-all, and I'm almost done. And catch-all is in D. It was pointed out. This is important. D states, I'm now in line, I'm sorry, line 5 or page 22, nothing in this section. So everything we've talked about, cause of action, a and B, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the rights, procedures, and remedies available under any law, including the Vermont Administrative Procedures 
act pursuant to, and there's a cost reference. So this is the catch-all <coughs> that this adds to, but does not take away from, and does not limit any existing right, whether that's under Rule uh, 75, or is actually another Rule 74, or the 807 action. So it doesn't take away anything. So uh, going back to an example that you used in response to one of uh, Barbara's uh, questions, if, if the, and I don't assume that this will happen, but if ANR, the rule making that comes out, uh, is pretty clear that it's no way going to reach those goals. Uh, the rule says only we will ask everybody to turn their lights off at night or whatever. I, again, ANR will do more than that, but I'm just saying if, if it's pretty clear that, that the rulemaking is not going to be sufficient, there could still be the action under the under the uh, APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, that it was arbitrary and capricious. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you are correct. Um, but as far as the the you haven't met that goal. And that's kind of that's the part that's really quite different. So you have you've done the rules, but the rules aren't achieving the right. emissions reduction. Right. right. Okay. And that, that wouldn't necessarily be a pretty that wouldn't necessarily be a straightforward standard APA type case, it seems. And that's that's I, in I part think you would bring that action under eight oh seven, the existing no, I'm just saying, should, but uh, under the current statute, right? Under the bill or the current statute? Uh, I'm sorry, under the, the bill. The bill, yeah. Say, yeah. That that provision B, sub subsection B, is really adding something different. That is, there's not necessarily a straight path under the Vermont APA in that scenario. Is that? I, I think there is a, a path, right? Whether you call it straight or not, I think it, it exists. It's there. But it also doesn't have the but substantial this, language and it doesn't no, absolutely. have the, but, but, the prompt. In the but this is different. You're right. Okay. B under the bill is different. And also, even if there's similarities, having it in the bill makes darn clear that you can proceed under that path and that path is available. Okay. So, thanks. It doesn't add. Thanks. That concludes Parker. my walkthrough. Oh, sorry. So if there's any questions. Yep. If, you were, if you were able to sort of sum up what um, this bill is hoping to accomplish. Is it making the rules more specific? Is it loosening some up? Like what, what is the overall attempt compared to other rules? Or I don't know, what's the overall attempt here? I think the people who sponsor this bill decided to include this language. So, I mean, it's a policy call. I think I've highlighted for you differences from right. existing law, I summarized for you what existing pathways there are. I've highlighted for you what's new, different, but it's a judgment call whether to include it or not. And, and I'm talking about the whole bill. Oh, okay. Because it, it, so I guess I'm wondering how often, given that I haven't had much to do with LCAR, is it unusual for things to be sort of tailored? Or are they usually more in line with very specific rulemaking processes? like you went over, or, because again, there are some variances, and I don't know if that's to expedite meeting the outcomes, or if it's to give defendants more, like I guess I'm just trying to figure out. Well, there's no differences in the LCAR process, right? except for that percent, requirement right, they have a yeah. detailed record. Um, you, you, the General Assembly, grants rulemaking authority in lots of contexts to lots of agencies right. and departments. So that's not unusual in that regard. This is very broad rulemaking authority. That's a little different. Okay. It's really broad. That's very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, do, do you know what the timeline is um, on the bill as far as uh, next steps, uh, which committees it's going to after it leaves us or anything? We don't have. I mean, we don't really have. We don't have possession of the bill either. It's, it's just by to either bless what we see or give them recommendations. Um, I'm not sure what what the committees. Do you know the committee's timeline upstairs as far as? <laughs> well, well, the question. I, I don't know. And there's no there's no appropriation in this bill. No. So there's no. So it may not go to another committee. I don't. I don't know. No, it was just a question because if. Uh, I wasn't sure if I should wait to amend the bill on the floor 
or what do you think? It depends what if yeah. it yeah if it pertains to our jurisdiction, then this is the place to have that discussion. Maybe maybe it maybe it might. Well, is it is it related to uh, section four of the cause of action? Uh, no. Then probably isn't. You probably should talk to Tim. Okay. And I assume also this is going to go through GovOps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just apply through uh, mm -hmm. because there is a commission created. Yeah. Or council, I guess it's right. called. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Luke, what happens if the um, ANR adopts rules and the legislature fails to appropriate necessary funds for it? And so, therefore, even though ANR has fulfilled their part of the process, um, the funds, necessary funds, weren't appropriate. Then they couldn't. Uh, you're talking about for ANR to engage in the rulemaking process, or they adopt rules requiring the, someone else to do something. The, and there's not funds to do it. They adopt rules. Yes. There's the funds would be required. An appropriation would be required to do it. Funds aren't appropriated. Um, what happens with the uh, with the people being able to take action? Sure. So um, as I point out, there's no appropriations bill. Um, so as far as ANR carrying out its rulemaking functions. I guess the assumption is they'll be able to do so with current resources. As to other resources that may be necessary to implement rules, I don't know what would happen if there's no appropriation to do so. I don't know. I guess, is the ability still there for someone to bring a, or to, to make a complaint based on inaction if the inaction is a result of? Failure to appropriate. I, I, I think there there could be. I mean, there's is that substantial cause language under B. So I don't know how the court would decide if that's a legitimate reason or not. I don't know. But I, I think you still perhaps could bring the cause of action. I think because uh, I was going to ask something similar to what you were getting at, and I think from my reading of it, and this, I don't know if this is how you would read it, Luke, but. If, for example, the legislature didn't appropriate, but the rules were in place, the the substantial cause of failure would not have been that the rules were not in place. The substantial cause of failure was that there was no funding for it. I don't know if I can say that with certainty. I think it's fact specific, case specific. I think it might depend on a number of factors. You can make that argument. It might be a legitimate argument, but I don't know how the court would rule. I can't predict that. Yeah, I was just going to comment. That was the intent for the substantial language. You know, not just that, but that was one of the scenarios that was thought of. Can you, know, you be more specific with what, when you say that's what was? The intent of having the substantial language, one of the scenarios that was considered is, well, what if, what if uh, they require, or what if a, a fee is required? What, what if tax is required, which is out of the jurisdiction of the ANR, wouldn't be in the right. rulemaking, or if the, uh, the rulemaking required expenditures to be approved by the legislature, you know, these are the kind of scenarios that at least uh, were kicked around mm -hmm. when I was talking about this bill with the, with the other sponsors, uh, that putting that substantial language in there is to try to catch that situation. But, you know, Luke is right, that it, you know, it's, it's not entirely clear what's out. It's a legitimate you know. argument. Whether it be a winning argument, how right. the game can predict. But if the remedy is a special is specifically additional time or it sounds like it, it, it could be. I mean it's you have a legitimate what you're saying is legit, it's a legitimate argument, whether we win or not we can't say. But remember under the bill, regardless of A and R, regardless of resources, regardless of appropriations under the modifications to the greenhouse gas reductions, making them mandatory as opposed to targets, the state is required to achieve those reductions one way or another. So there's the other countervailing argument. You're obligated by law to achieve those emissions reductions one way or another. Lack of resources may not be good enough. So you can make different arguments. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.
Good morning. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm Rob McDougall. I'm the Chief of the Environmental Protection Division at the Attorney General's Office. And with me is Laura Murphy, one of our Assistant Attorneys General uh, at the Attorney General's Office. Um, the Attorney General wasn't able to make it today. He apologizes for not being able to be here. Um, we also want to thank the committee and the others that have worked on this bill for their work on it. Um, we believe it's a very important issue. The Attorney General is of the firm belief that the climate crisis is real, that this bill is a valuable tool to fight climate change. It makes goals of greenhouse gas reductions into requirements. It's an opportunity for Vermont to lead. We've fallen behind our neighboring states uh, in our greenhouse gas emission reductions, and this is a chance to get us back where we believe we should be. We also noted um, when we testified in the House uh, Energy and Technology Committee last week that we can't count on the federal government anymore to do some of the climate change work that they have done in the past. So Vermont really has to take the opportunity to uh, act on its own behalf. Uh, it's important in this rule to give the Agency of Natural Resources the, re the resources it needs to comply. It's a very robust rulemaking process, and it's important that the agency have the resources to um, make this bill work in practice. And then finally, uh, and most importantly probably for this committee, the Attorney General supports government accountability. And so the idea that there is causes of actions with attorney's fees attached to them is an important step um, to make sure that the state does its part. Uh, so that's something we can talk more about, but we're of the firm belief that the attorney's fees kind of put some teeth into this bill to make sure that the state does the job that it's tasked to do under this bill. So with that kind of introduction, I'm happy to take questions, Laura and I both. We can address some of the questions that were asked as well. Laura kept a list um, if you want to go that, through that. That'd be great, um, unless you have anything else that you wanted to No, I can certainly share. start. We can start with some of the questions that came up earlier. Um, but just as a, a starting place, and Luke talked about this, but I think in terms of conceptualizing the three causes of action, there's the existing one where you can challenge a rule after it's written. That's under the APA. Uh, you do that within a year. And so that's where the rule comes out and we really don't think it's going to work. We don't think it's in line with the statute, so someone might challenge it. Uh, the question came up whether that would be a record review case, and the answer is yes. Under 807 and Rule 74, it's, it's a record review case. It should be. <laughs> and there's case law saying that these are record review cases. Um, a plaintiff can't come in and, and put on all new evidence and say, a and R should have done this with the rule. It's going to be based on the record that the agency developed when it was developing the rule. So what that means, of course, is that the agency needs to have a good record. There needs to be a reasonable basis in that record for the rule that the agency made. So uh, there is case law that these are record review cases. I suppose a court could um, Try to try to go the other way and say no. We're going to have a trial, but I think that would be really unusual um, and, and really not in line with the existing law. So, so there's that APA challenge, and then the first cause of action in this. Me, yes. A follow-up question. Yeah. To that. Uh, and I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but there are are there some exceptions to record review uh, that that um, I mean very limited. I understand where a plaintiff can say, well, they didn't consider these five other factors which have been critical for this and here are documents or here's testimony whatever to show that this is something that should have been considered and was absent from the record. I think we'd expect that that would have been raised in the rulemaking process by the plaintiff that it would, have, would not be new evidence presented to the court on the rule challenge. If that's so, so they'd be foreclosed from trying to bring that forward in the court case. That's how so there are provisions for supplementing the record sometimes in, in rule challenges, and there are specific criteria you have to meet. So normally, yes. The, um, ideally, the relevant evidence would be before the agency during the rulemaking process. There are some exceptions for supplementing the record or, in this case, um, or providing extra record evidence, which I guess is what the, this would have to be. There's specific criteria you have to meet, which I can't recall well, no, <laughs> off the top right. of my head. Okay. But but the other thing is, if the agency failed to consider, you know, X Y Z, the court can also say, because you failed to consider X Y Z, and I don't have it before me, I'm going to remand to the agency because as it currently exists, there's not a reasonable basis. Without X Y Z materials, there's no reasonable basis. So there's a few different ways the court can approach it. So, so could you explain just generally a record review case as far as 
how complicated or versus you know how resource intensive, etc., versus a case that can be brought with testimony, such a de novo review essentially. Just so people understand the realm of what, what we're providing here versus what people might imagine is a trial and such. No, yeah, I said, look, the most recent one that we dealt with in the Environmental Protection Division was some of the rule um, making that ANR did around the PFOA contamination in Bennington. And so St. Cobain at various points challenged that rule making and we were teeing up a rule challenge case that was actually dismissed as part of the settlement. Um, and that would have been a fairly complex um, record because there was a lot of science involved when you're setting limits on the levels of toxins and things like that. So. You can speak more, but the rule, it can vary widely how complex a rulemaking process is based on what is being considered. Um, and so that can lead to a very complex case, potentially, because the record could be so uh, heavy uh, with details. But, but you would have the record existing, right? right? So you wouldn't have to be putting evidence on in court, and it would be looking at a potentially really lengthy, complex record, hundreds of studies about, in our, you know, the PFOA example, PFOA, its toxicity, um, documents from the agency, um, you know, setting the rule and things like that. But you're really just looking at, it, you know, at this record, are these peer-reviewed studies, does this make sense, did the agency consider these things as a reasonable versus, if you, which I think is the second cause of action in this bill, before you would have a trial. Yeah, yeah. and before you move, I just, I apologize. Yeah. I just want to, I understand the record review cases can be very complicated, but I even just your example of PFOA. I look at the other, another case that's going on right now, seeking medical monitoring, which is not a record review case. It's been going on for months, if not years, already, and it's a, a different level of how much resource intensive with discovery. I know the record review, sure. but I could imagine yeah. a full uh, trial on that issue that you're talking about would be even. Ugly I think that it's more was kind of getting at this. The second cause of action, the second new cause of action in this one, the kind of the rules not working challenge. Um, that case, or a case like you're describing with the medical monitoring, where you're having experts, depositions, a lot of discovery, things like that are absent from a rule challenge on the record. So I can't say that every rule case would be resolved by motion. <laughs> it may be some working court, you know, in front of a judge on our feet. Um, but it's certainly a lot different than. A case that requires a lot of kind of pre courtroom work in depositions, preparation, witnesses, experts, all the kind of things that might happen when you're bringing in new evidence to a judge that isn't part of a record that's before the judge. So it, it's not as the cost may be less on a rule challenge than you would have on a kind of open ended litigation. Thanks. Agreed. And um, so, so that's the APA challenge that we currently have. Then when you get to the bill, there's a first cause of action, which I think of as a deadline suit, and Luke kind of talked about that um, in those terms as well. At the federal level, that's what um, they're typically called is deadline suits, and it's really did a &R issue the rules on this exact date, and if not, and the 60 days notice, one can bring a suit, and it's pretty cut and dry. They met the deadline or they didn't, and the remedy is, as, as Luke was saying, also cut and dry. Please go issue the rules, or not please, but go issue the rules. Um, and then the, th the second cause of action under the bill, which is the third remedy uh, that Luke talked about, as, as we I, sure I said yeah. on, on that one, could you comment on how uh, the language will prompt and effective the, the if the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to adopt or update the rules, the court may grant the secretary reasonable time. That seems to add a little complication to the court, not just saying go back and do it. Or, or could you just comment on that? I, mean, I think if, um, and we, you know, the Attorney General's office, we don't write the rules, but we would defend the state in a lawsuit, right? Mm -hmm. So we're the ones that have to go to court on this, working with our agency partners. Um, I, I think if we were to go into court and say that the agency was 90% of the way there, kind of thing, or 80% of the way there, and they're doing a good faith effort to meet these deadlines, um, you know, it would give the court the opportunity to recognize that good work and maybe give a little more extension of time so that the it's not a drop dead date in some ways, but I think we, that you ha you can't just go in and say we haven't done anything yet. It has to really be that we've been progressing. I think to make that argument valid in front of a judge, um, and you know the kind of good faith effort of the state to, to meet the deadlines. Um, I don't think we read that to give the agency the ability to kind of take a pass and come to court and say, hey, we'll start working on it, kind of thing. 
so I think we have something to add. But I think it's, you know, we have to kind of have made a good faith, reasonable effort to meet the deadlines in any instance um, for to present a valid argument in front of the judge. So if that language wasn't here, would you still be in that situation to argue that to the judge? I'm just curious. Are I think you really it's adding a, something, which I like that language. I'm not, but I'm just. I think it does add something because I think that it, um, when it, absent that, it can be really read as a line in the sand, drop dead date, that you either met it or you didn't. And I think that's going to be the, the theme of that cause of action anyway. It's really black or white. We either met the deadline or we didn't. But if we're kind of meeting it or we're almost meeting it, we have a little more ability to argue that let us finish our job. Um, so. And one thing the language might add is, is giving the court more comfort that it can it, it can say yes you failed to meet the deadline a and r you lose we lose the lawsuit but maybe giving the court more comfort in saying i know i can think about what the agency is doing and take that into account in establishing the timeline that i'm going to make the agency meet so i think as luke said earlier arguably the court could could already do that but i, I do think this is helpful in providing additional guidance And then just on the third cause of action, um, we've already talked about it a little bit. It is different. It's really an after, I sort of think of an after the fact rule challenge where you have a rule that's probably been out for several years because you have to wait for the inventory to come out. But then there's an opportunity for a person to say, wait, these really aren't working. We really need to go back and make sure we're gonna write better rules that will work. So that's sort of the vehicle for that. And I, I would agree with the testimony earlier about the substantial cause language and some of the questions around that. That, that is really helpful in ensuring that if this case is brought, it has to be shown that the rules themselves are really the problem, right? Not a failure of the rules to be followed or, or some, some other sort of failure, because otherwise it won't do any good to rewrite the rules. So those are the thoughts on that. Like, as to attorney's fees you know, on those. I'm sorry, yeah. before you get yeah. some questions on. So I was asking a question as far as uh, whether we should tighten the language uh, as far as what relief uh, the court could order. And if you could kind of give me input on, on the pluses and minuses of doing that. Uh, do we want the court to have more discretion to point the agency in a particular way? Why or why not? And, and if not, uh, what your suggestions might be for, for narrowing this. And so that's a question that came up last week when we were in House Energy and Technology as well. The question was kind of, um, is the court going to write the rules or is the agency going to write the rules? Or could the court write the rules in that second cause of action instance? And so we've, um, we're finalizing um, a written response to that question for the House Energy and Technology Committee, but we can preview um, the thought on that a little bit. And, if um, you could provide us that yeah. answer too. We need sure, to we can send the, the written uh, same here. But that, we had a couple language tweaks to that um, second cause of action that we thought would make it more clear that the remedy is kind of a remand back to the agency to make rules consistent with the goals of this section in uh, the bill. So you don't want the court to come up with uh, the plan? <coughs> That's not our place to say um, it's really but I think that the thought that we heard in that committee last week was that they want the agency to do their job as the experts and write these rules and not have a judge that's not as familiar come up with the rule in, in the court hearing so um, we'll have that send it to your way too and that's typically the court oh, I'm sorry. oh no go ahead oh that's typically what a court would do should do anyway in a typical rule challenge is is remand back to the agency because the court is just reviewing for does this comply with the rulemaking standards not rewriting the rules but because this new cause of action is different um we, we do think it might be worthwhile to tweak the language are you all set yeah thanks so as i as i read the um uh subsection b here the, this cause of action there's kind of two scenarios. I mean, one is like you made the rules, you followed the rules, but it turned out the rules didn't work and you need to go back and, and rethink the rules. I think the second scenario um, is closer to what I think Representative Richelson was talking about earlier, where you made the rules, you made the blueprint, but you didn't do the work you didn't fully implement um, the roadmap, essentially, that was laid out there. And I'm wondering just if you see, um, you know, how you see the remedy in that second case, like it. The, the 
playing first, out. That, I mean, that ties obviously to kind of what we said earlier about the resources to the agency too. It's going to be right. so important to give the agency the resources Absolutely. it needs to make this work. Right. Um, because if they can write the greatest rule, if they don't have the tools to implement it, it's not going to work and do what we want it to do. Um, so the, the second example there, I think it goes back to that language about is the rule the substantial cause of the failure to meet the goals or requirements? Mm -hmm. And if the rule itself is not, I think the defense would be that it's not the rules problem that it didn't work, <laughs> um, that there's a whole bunch of other factors that came into play. And it could be the resources, it could be the, you know, the whole different, that people aren't following the rule. Um, but I, I think that, that substantial cause language gives the state the ability to say we, we did a rule that would put us on a path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as required, and so that the rule is not the substantial cause of the failure to meet those requirements. Um, to add to that. I guess and then after that the question is probably a policy question well now what right if there's if they're really just the rules aren't being implemented or there aren't adequate resources then then what um, and i this mm -hmm. doesn't address that mm -hmm. it, and the, you know the other thing is the agency of natural resources kind of charged with being the lead agency on this rulemaking process but there's going to be a lot of other agencies and departments that have to kind of do their part to make this work too so um, it's tricky to hold A&R accountable if there's another agency that's not doing their part or some other outside uh, piece of this that's not the agency's fault for writing a great rule. <laughs> you know, it might be that that plays out that way. Mm -hmm. so. so I actually have two questions. One in what you just said. So let's say the Department of Human Services is not meeting their part of it. Obviously, What's the remedy there? Like, can one department sort of throw another department under the bus? Does one department take action against? Like, obviously, the state doesn't want to sue itself. Um, you know, I think that the the defense to a rule challenge would be that the rule is not a substantial cause of the failure to meet the goals. Right. And that's you know, I don't think we would throw people under the bus. Right. Well, I, I guess I'm just... But, yeah, it's, um, like the, but the, the rules have the force and effect of law, right, when they go through sure. the process. And so there may be other actions that could be brought against an agency that's failing to do their part, separate from this bill. So is a &R, like, responsible for the other departments doing their part, or they're not really, and each department is held accountable on their own, I guess is what it meant. I don't think they could write the rules without input from the agencies and departments they are going to have to have a part in the process. Again, that's not kind of in this bill. Sure. They're going to kind of be the, the lead on it, but they have to work with their agency partners to make this work. And so I, I won't be a surprise to those agencies sure. if they have a part to play, I hope. <laughs> right. Um, so in the third cause of action, if a business all of a sudden says, wow, we had no idea we would have to put up this much money, or we now have to get, uh, you know, we have to build something else. Is that, I mean, would they have a cause of action just based on like of resources at that point? Like I know we're talking about A&R having enough. You're talking about the third cause of action, yeah. the existing APA rule challenge. Um, I think that you know that, that has a longer timeline, so it's a year from the implementation of the rule when it becomes final. Right. So there's quite a period there. There's also a very robust process for rulemaking, and so there's public meetings that have to be held around the state, and so you would hope that people that would be affected in that way would have some awareness of it and would have participated. Um, and, and then the bill sets up these kind of reviews of the rule every couple of years too, so there may be other chances to kind of come in if that's the case in the, in the secondary or third rulemaking. Thank you. Yeah, okay. There was also a question about attorney's fees earlier, existing attorney's fees. Um, currently under Vermont law, unless a statute provides essentially for attorney's fees, uh, it's each party handles their own fees. And so when it comes to the attorney fee provision here, that is adding something to existing law as far as attorney's fees go. There are other provisions of Vermont law, as I'm sure you're aware, that do provide for attorney's fees. Um, but this would be adding that when it comes to the uh, APA rulemaking challenge that currently, actually no, I take it all back. It, this, the attorney's fees doesn't apply to that rulemaking challenge, so we, we still wouldn't have attorney's fees there. But, but this does add fees for the other two causes of action. And just on that point, so you know, you have the, the deadline suit, you know, that attorney's fees there, that may be a, a, an easier case because that probably is a motion case that either did or didn't happen. Um, the second case, the, um, 
rules in place and it's not working, that's where you're going to see potentially more significant attorney's fees in play if um, someone uh, prevails. And that, you know, it could be a very legitimate dispute over science in that case. And, you know, this agency could have done a great job, but, you know, someone else may come in with their science and show the rule's not working and the court may agree. And there's attorney's <coughs> fees that could be substantial because we're talking then in that case potentially about discovery and experts and depositions and all the kind of things associated with litigation. Um, and then the APA case, um, the existing one, there's no um, attorney's fees there. And last week when we were in the House Energy and Technology Committee, uh, the Attorney General was there and, and he, again, supports attorney's fees because it gives teeth to the bill, it holds government accountable. And knowing that we have to defend these cases, the best defense to a, a case like this is to do good rules, make them work, meet the goals, meet the requirements. Um, and that's, again, the resource issue, too. We want to make sure that works, and then we don't have to, you know, there's no damages here. It's just attorney's fees, and we can prevent that by making good rules and meeting the requirements. So this may not be a question for you, but I'm just wondering, because I don't know how government works compared to, like, private organizations. Does the state have um, the kind of insurance that covers the suit if somebody does sue to help reimburse for lawyer's fees, or that's just a surprise in the budget in a year? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, we, we tend to do enforcement work and not the sure, work, I didn't so it that. might be, yeah. And if the state wins and it's frivolous, does the AG's office get reimbursed for the time? Like, so you actually would fill out, like, what this is what? The, the fees. And okay. the same rules would apply to us as would apply to plaintiffs. And it's important to know that, you okay. know, when the court looks at attorney's fees, you have to keep a documented record of your time that you spent sure. on this. <laughs> and the court also applies a reasonableness standard, and that applies, you know, kind of a, a localized um, value of attorney's time. So you're not looking at, like, a New York rate. You're looking at a Vermont rate. And so um, we would track our time. If a case were frivolous and we prevailed, we might seek our attorney's costs as well. And again, you don't know where that money goes. Our, the money we get goes to the general fund. Okay. Yeah. 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 I did, so I yeah. So yeah. I'm assuming the lawsuit money comes out of the general fund or whatever. But again, I'm sure. For that, yeah, I don't have an answer. Thank you, Matt. And then we'll take a break and another part. Yeah. So you t thank you. You talked a little bit about how this is a little is different um, from the scope um, and not being an attorney, do we have any idea of how much we're sort of putting the state on the hook for for each one of these based on work that you've done in the past, just so we can have a rough idea? It's tricky to say. I think last week when that question was asked, it was, you know, the idea that this isn't, we're not talking about damages here. The remedy right. is to do the rule, make the rule work. Um, so it's less in that way than the case we would have damages in play. But it's tricky to say on the attorney's fees what those might be, except to say that, you know, um, and I'm channeling my boss from last week, and he, he said that, the, that this climate change is so important that we kind of all need to be in on that and that the, the worry of attorney's fees should not trump the need to move forward with meaningful greenhouse gas emission reductions. And so, so I guess that brings me to the next question. Do you, should we be looking at amending um, the current law and the way things work so that attorney's fees can be sought in any situation where someone's challenging a rule? Well, the APA, you're saying add that to the APA challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that's our place to say um, in that the... But the Attorney General's office is testifying very strongly in favor of doing it in this case, so why would it not be your place to talk about that in other cases in other all the different rulemakings that the state <laughs> yeah. does um, you're the ones that process uh, that, that we're not that asking for it in the APA rulemaking for this bill I mean, we're only saying for these two new causes of action they're created for the deadline suit and for the does the rule work case attorney's fees will be appropriate there we're not saying that in a rule challenge there should be attorney's fees to these rules but isn't there an accountability and transparency piece to those as well I, I think that's fair point and um, but I, I don't think there's so much rulemaking that goes on in state government mm -hmm. on varying levels of significance um, that I don't know that we're in a position to say. I'm not authorized to say that they were right. I understand that. Yeah, but I think <laughs> just, just I'm just happy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Just a, a follow-up question that kind of relates to the attorney. As far as the number of cases that we can 
think might be brought under this. It, it, my understanding, tell me if I'm wrong on this, is that uh, you have a deadline that's missed if it's missed. And I guess any number of people could bring a lawsuit for that. But presumably, that would be all consolidated into one case because it's one challenge. And I would think the same thing would happen if the target's not met. You know, when that, there's a definitive time when that inventory comes out, and if everybody wants to bring a lawsuit on that, once again, it would be consolidated into one case, would it not? So, I mean, it's limited scope of the number of cases that we're talking about in this in this bill. And we get those questions last week too, it was the consolidation question and also kind of uh, what about a class action kind of scenario where you might have multiple. Um, and so in both cases we thought that a court would consolidate similar cases. We probably are not looking at a situation where you're paying five, six, seven attorney's fees. It's really one plaintiff's attorney's fees, reasonable fees that a court would then distribute among multiple attorneys, but um, that's the way we would envision it. Happening. It would seem like in the next 10 years, if all goes wrong for the government, we're talking three cases, they maybe big, big cases. The, the third case being if there is a challenge to the actual rulemaking, which is not necessarily going to happen. That's fair. Okay. All right, let's um, take a break. And I think you have more questions. Yeah, I have some more yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah, okay, so let's take about 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Do you want to touch base really quick? Um, so I'm not sure if you had additional comments or if uh, we'll, what we're looking at so far. Or otherwise, I'll I have other some other questions. So just by in a preface, um, this all looks great. I think uh, it's coming along really well, having the causes of actions. But I'm I'm still concerned that uh, when plaintiffs get to court sometime in the future. Uh, they have the barrier of having to prove standing uh, to, to be able to proceed with the case. Uh, they have to show their particularized injury, they have to show causation, they have to show redressability. Um, my question for you, and it's really not on the particularized injury component of it, but is if there's anything, well first of all, your view of the bill as it stands right now, uh, and if there's anything additional we can do uh, to help individuals be able to establish standing. And I, you know, I just looked recently at the Juliana case and uh, out in the Ninth Circuit uh, that looked at an issue of standing with respect to climate. It's, it's different, it was suing the federal government and such, but, but that's kind of really brings us to the fore, for me at least. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could comment on, on that. And again, if, there's any, if you don't have anything particular right now, if you could think further, if there's anything in here as far as establishing uh, a redressability through a procedural injury type approach or something. I know that we alone are not gonna solve climate change through this bill. And that's, so we have to make sure though there's still an avenue for having folks proceed. So I'll be quiet just to stay on. Yeah. So uh, on the standing, I mean, or if you want to answer that, you've done some research on the standing piece. Sure, and I think um, the committee may already be aware of this, but as currently drafted in the two causes of action in this bill, it says any person may bring the cause of action. And that language, the federal courts have interpreted to be as, as broad as possible under Article 3 of the Constitution. So under Article 3, and this is both state and federal, in order to get into court, there has to be a case or controversy, and part of what that means, case or controversy in quotes, part of what that means is that a person has to have standing, and of course that's injury that's traceable to the defendant that's redressable by a court. So when the language any person is used, that typically means, and of course I've interpreted it to mean, if they have Article Three standing, they get in the door. So there's not any other statutory barrier in this bill to prevent a person from getting into court. So in, what what is that called? There's there's the Article Three standing, and then there's the kind of something else that you're referring to. Is there sometimes for statutory causes of action, there may be additional requirements. So for instance, it may say any person I'm making this up who lives on Wilson Street can bring a cause of action, right? So any person would be anyone with Article Three standing, but Wilson Street further narrows who can bring a cause of action. This bill doesn't have we're, that. We're broad. It's broad, right. And it's consistent with the federal similar citizen suit uh, bills that you know, we're familiar with in environmental law. 
And in terms of the, this idea that any person can bring a challenge is consistent with kind of similar provisions in federal law for different environmental statutes that have citizen suit provisions. So it's, it's a model we're familiar with in environmental law. And the environmental court is familiar as well. I understand on the federal side where you want to say anyone can, on you know, Vermont law, would there be a possibility of limiting it to uh, people within the state or lawyers or groups that are practiced or registered in the state? I, I think that's kind of getting to her point about kind of that Wilson Street example, if you wanted to kind of put but those in can there. can we? Is that allowable? I, I think that we had, there are other examples of that where we've seen similar um, limitations on what a person, Article 3 standing plus, so that's something that's in law in other places, so the answer I think is yes. So I think that as a commentary on this, if we are going to um, sort of create a new mechanism for people receiving um, court costs uh, that and attorney's fees back, it may be worthwhile <coughs> to examine, you know, if we want some citizens group in California being able to sue and Vermont courts for this purpose. So, uh, yes, we can then ask some of the other folks about that as well, but does Article 3 standing already do that, if you could go on? I mean, it, does it already limit in practicality to Vermonters or, or not necessarily? But if you could describe Article sure. 3 standing, maybe to answer that question in that context as well. I wouldn't say necessarily it has to be Vermonters, um, but certainly if there's a, a group out in California that really has no interest in Vermont or is not going to be, would not benefit at all from the rules that Vermont is supposed to promulgate and adopt, that person would not have an injury or that group would not have any injury for what's happening in Vermont. So it could be difficult for that group to get into court. So that so Article 3 standing is already a gatekeeper in Even that sense. Even when referring to global climate change. Well, that would be a question. So I think the question would be, um, does a group out in California have a sufficient injury from Vermont's failure to adopt sufficient greenhouse gas reductions to be able to get into the court? That would be a question. Or New Hampshire. Or, or New Hampshire. Or perhaps there are Vermonters who come here in the summer and they enjoy the lake and now there's more algae blooms. And so that would be an example of something that would probably qualify. Yeah, I guess the question is, would the injury have to be tied to Vermont? And you're saying not necessarily. Well, I suppose one would have to, and this is just you know, hypothetically, one might have to show that Vermont's failure to reduce greenhouse gas reductions actually has an effect on this person in California. And what that would look like for that showing, I'm, it's hard to say. And just a word on attorney's fees to kind of, kind of fits into your question as well. When the court considers reasonable attorney's fees, um, the guidance that comes from the, um, in Vermont, it's the Perez case from 2006. And the starting point is called the Lodestar amount, which is maybe something we, you guys are familiar with. And so that's the number of hours, reasonable number of hours spent on a case multiplied by a reasonable hourly rate. Um, and that is based, so that means that that amount is based on a reasonable market rate, not necessarily what's paid to the attorney. So it's not just the attorney showing the court his bill or her bill, it's based on that kind of calculation. And it requires an accurate record of time showing what you spent on the litigation. Um, and then other factors that can be considered by a court um, are rates charged by other attorneys for similar services in the same vicinity the experience of attorneys, the background of attorneys, the novelness of the issue before the court. But when we think about a court considering reasonable attorney's fees, we view it as there's an argument that you have to kind of look at the Vermont rates, not a California lawyer's rates. Mm -hmm. So um, regardless of who the plaintiff is, the attorney's fees under that Perez case would seemingly <coughs> be based on kind of what's the going rate in Vermont knowing that there are some other factors about experience and novelty of the issue and that sort of thing, but there is a role for kind of what's the Vermont rate. So it doesn't matter where the attorney's from necessarily, but kind of what people pay here. So it's not just the bill submitted. It's not just the bill submitted. That's not enough for a court to just say, you paid this, you know, here you go. Um, so there's Thank a little you. bit more to it. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. <coughs> so that all sounds good in a world that I don't live in, so to say. But most citizens don't have the money to 
to uh, to put up with a lawsuit like this. And uh, yeah, big staff attorneys that come in, doesn't matter from where they are, they're gonna come in here, they're gonna fight for what they believe in and stuff. So um, it seems like to me this is ripe for abuse. Like we're, we're talking like it's not gonna happen and we, we, we know it's always abuse. So how, how are we going to deal with that? Deal with? <clears throat> that it doesn't get abused. I well, mean, we, are, we, we know we have a pro problem with climate. We, we know it's the hot topic, the, the hot button. But how are we going to keep it from abused, being abused from, from monetary, from, a, from regular everyday citizens <coughs> or people that are in this business that are trying to do the right thing? So is your question, um, I'm having trouble understanding, if, if, if the question is kind of is the, the impact of the rule going to be felt on everyday people or is the question about how does the state avoid paying attorney's fees to folks that challenge the rule? I think it's going to be uh, most citizens won't have the money to go and deal with these lawsuits, right? So, so the the attorneys fighting these people will just, they'll just run out of money and bankruptcy or, or whatever happened, they, they, they won't be able to fight it. So last week in the House Energy and Technology Committee, we got questions about kind of the, the ability of the citizens of Vermont to have a say on the rules and kind of have their voice heard. Um, and so if that's kind of where your question is rooted, I think that that kind of robust rulemaking process allows for public participation in the rulemaking process. When a case gets brought, um, you know, I think that if your question is, will people have the resources to take on the state, um, I, don't, I don't know that there's an answer for that that we can provide. Um, so can I clarify uh, as well? Your concern, Ken. Individuals can't be sued under this. Is that the concern? In well, what about business? Businesses, what businesses can't be sued under this either. This this is a law. This is this is opening up a lawsuit against ANR, the Agency of Natural Resources. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know what the rulemaking would somehow create an ability to sue an individual or not. I wouldn't. No be. companies, no, nobody that's trying to conform, conform to these statutes? I think the question goes to kind of what is going to be the effect of the rule on Vermonters that, uh, as a whole. And I don't know that we have an answer for that because we don't know what the rules are right now. That's and if I, can I could clarify one other thing, and maybe you should do this instead for me. Could, could you explain how the Clean Water Act works with uh, uh, enforcement where individuals can actually bring a lawsuit against a private citizen and that this is not that. But maybe you could explain. Sure, sure. and I'm happy to say that we have a water law expert here with us today. Um, so Laura will be happy to answer that. Here's the bus. No, but it's, uh, it's basically just what you described. Under the clean, Federal Clean Water Act and lots of other federal environmental statutes, citizens not just the state can bring enforcement actions against persons or entities that are violating the law. So if someone is discharging um, toxins from an industrial facility into the Winooski River without a permit, if that's a violation of the Federal Clean Water Act, any person can bring a suit, any person is standing against the violator and get an injunction and penalties, no damages. In Vermont, we don't have a citizen suit provision currently for our environmental laws. And so the state is the only entity that can enforce those provisions. Uh, so that's basically what it is. So for this current bill, the cause of action is just creating a cause of action against the state, not against entities that may be subject to the rules that ANR is going to adopt. Um, so there's so currently, there wouldn't be a cause of action for citizens to bring for violation of the rules. If that answers the question. Yeah, for right now. Yeah, for I mean, at at the at the level that we're at, yeah, 
I mean, I, I, I have a lot more to do with money with this. So, so um, getting back to Article 3 uh, and uh, standing, if you describe that briefly uh, for us, and, and also, again, if there's how that works with this bill, if there's anything else we can do to address uh, the barriers that Article 3 standing could possibly raise in, in this kind of a case. And, and if you don't have any ideas right now, you can ponder, but if you could just kind of describe the. Sure, so um, it's basically the Department of Revenue has a to, to be able to get into court under Article 3 standing, a person or an organization or a corporation needs to have an injury. And that typically can be pretty broad. Um, it does need to be imminent and actual, meaning it's not something hypothetical that may happen in the future. Um, trying to think of, there's lots of good examples from environmental law that I'm sure some of the other witnesses could testify about as well. But for instance, there was a federal case that's kind of famous where a citizen was trying to bring a case under the Federal Endangered Species Act to protect a species, but the Supreme Court essentially said, well, you don't have an injury, and, and the species was not somewhere this person lived, right? It was, I believe, overseas, and the court said, or, or far away, you don't have an injury because you don't have any concrete plans to actually ever go back to that place, to ever see the species again, or ever enjoy the species again. And so that was an example where there wasn't a sufficient injury because it wasn't imminent, it wasn't actual, there were no plans. Things that have qualified, um, certainly if, if you live near a river that's polluted because of an upstream industrial facility, you smell the pollution, you see the pollution, you used to go fishing, you can't go fish anymore, those sorts of things qualify as injuries. For the fairly, the next requirement is basically causation, but it's not that stringent. It's, is, is your injury fairly traceable to whatever the, the defendant has done or failed to do? So in the industrial facility example, you would say it's fairly traceable because this is the facility that dumped the toxins into the river that's killing the fish. You can fairly trace that to the defendant. In terms of redressability, and this is the third requirement for standing, the court has to be able to do something about it. So if it's a problem that the court simply cannot fix, if, if there's something, if there's nothing the court can do to actually help to fix the problem, there's no redressability and there's no standing. When it comes to the types, certainly the first deadline suit, um, the first cause of action, um, those the cases in the federal level have certainly held that citizens do have standing to bring those suits. And the, redress, it's the redressability, I think, and I, my, my initial thought is the bill, I don't have any ideas right now about what can make it more clear that a court could provide redressability because the, the bill clearly says if ANR doesn't write the rules, the court has to tell ANR to write the rules. Or if ANR doesn't write sufficient rules, the court has to tell ANR to write sufficient rules. So those both seem to me to be fairly straightforward in terms of yes, the court can address these issues. I don't know if you have additional. No, I, I mean the findings play a part in that kind of the intent of the bill. Yeah. In terms of injury. Setting out an injury. Well, and, and when it comes to climate, I guess. This isn't something that I have looked at closely. It's, it's what is sufficient to establish an injury for climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. I think with the deadline suit, it's pretty easy. There's been a failure to adopt the rule. Um, it, the, the court might look to, as Rob was saying, might look to the legislation to figure out the injury. And the injury needs to be tied to the problem that was supposed to be addressed, right? So you can't just have an injury that's not tied to climate, I mean, right, change under this bill. So the findings in the bill might be relevant. The court might look to that to say, oh, climate change is a problem. It's causing X, Y, Z. This person is suffering X, Y, Z. That could be relevant. If, if the findings in the report refer to, I mean, just reading the findings in the report and all the global um, uh, issues related to, like, to climate change, I'm just wondering how that doesn't open this wide open for legislative intent. In terms of... Injuries, showing Showing, injuries. 
we're, I think regardless of the legislature's intent, there would still have to be an, an injury shown. So I don't think the mere fact that there are findings could per se establish an injury. Um, and, I, and my understanding is the findings are, you know, based on my perusal, reasonable, they're founded in the literature and the science, and so... Um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's the, that, I think that's the point. The signs of climate change are all around us, hence the, the, the need for something like this right away. How a court would go about parsing that out, short of saying that anyone subjected to any issue related to climate change would have an injury, I'm just not seeing it, how, how it's narrow. <coughs> that this is one of the most broad pieces of legislation that I've ever seen. And I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not fighting against this. I'm a co-sponsor of this legislation. Yeah. But I, I'm just having a hard time finding how someone wouldn't be injured. And the, but Article 3 standing is its own consideration by court. And so the broadness of the findings and intent doesn't necessarily impact that because someone still has to show that they're injured under Article 3. And it, you know, it may be that someone argues very broadly that they have standing under Article 3, but I don't think it's going to turn on the findings and the intent of this bill, even if it's broad. Yeah, I have a question, and it's if I'm completely off base or don't know what I'm talking about, you can dismiss it right away. <laughs> but uh, so when when an action is taken against the state in, under this bill, what potentially, if it was proven that the Agency of Natural Resources <coughs> did not do what it was expected to do, um, what would the state potentially have to pay to the people bringing the action? That's difficult to say in the abstract. It kind of goes to that case by case thing. Except to say that the, I, we think the first cause of action, the deadline suit one, that's really black or white. Either the rule was written or it wasn't. You know, and that is probably a case where it's a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment. It's a legal filing, paperwork. There may be a hearing, but it's not a full scale litigation because it's so black or white. So probably not as much on the first cause of action. The second cause of action does open the door to potentially um, more in attorney's fees as a payout because that's where you have this kind of science battle. Uh, it could be a battle of the experts um, and you have attorney's fees, costs, depositions, litigation <coughs> expenses. So there's potentially more risk in the second cause of action than the first, but it's difficult to say here's a dollar amount that we might be right. subject to at this point. But aside from just the costs of, you know, working with through the courts, is there any kind of like payout that would be given to someone? Is any damages? No, there's no happen? damages in this bill. Um, the remedy is, you know, write the rule or revise the rule as we read it. There's no um, payout for damages, and that's an important distinction. Um, that this is just talking about attorney's fees, and the remedy is craft the rule or mm -hmm. rewrite the rule. Um, I think that answers my question. If I remember the second half of what I was going to ask. I'm sorry. Can you yeah, do, 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 um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying I'm keeping it to the yeah, yeah, no section. So we in, I guess in the back of my head looking at this, I'm envisioning someone uh, bringing a suit based on feeling that we didn't go far enough. Um, is there an, is there something in this that allows for us to be a, some sort of way to bring a case about going too far or you know litigating climate change as a as a principle or something like that? If, if someone felt that the rules were the too came out were too stringent, too stringent. Too, yeah. Um, well, you have the APA remedy there, right? So you can challenge the rule when it comes out up to one year from the day of its final. That's right. potentially, I, I don't know that there's a new cause of action created for 
what you've described, except to say that that third existing cause of action is where yes. a case like that might happen. And that's what happened in the St. Cobain challenge to the PFOA rule. They felt that the state's standard of 20 parts per trillion for PFOA was too stringent, and they brought a rule challenge where we eventually settled that without a determination. But if they, their case was that 20 is too low, it should be higher. And so they used that APA process to bring that case in. People do that with rules. They say they're too restrictive or too stringent. And that's under current. That's, that's existing like law. law. There's no attorney's fees with that. It's yep. just, yeah. And um, I know that other states have done this as well. Is this sort of modeled after, do we know if this is similar to the way other states do it? I know it's going to be slightly different because we have a different process. That might be a question best posed to, to the Legislative Council. We have kind of I'll yeah. do that at some point. Yep. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask you. <laughs> Just go back and forth. Uh, so the, the costs, because I don't know, I mean, it's a good question in general. The costs um, of attorney fees and, and, and things through court proceedings, what uh, funds does that come out of? I mean, if this comes to be a fairly expensive trial that ends up being one decent amount of attorney fees paid to the winning side, uh, where does that come out of state government funds? And that's, um, we can certainly provide an answer to that as our understanding. I don't have that available for me today. It was similar to the question that was posed earlier about uh, whether there's insurance for this. So we can certainly provide a little more if you'd like on that yeah. as to our understanding. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Megan O'Toole. Um, I'm the Associate General Counsel for the Air Quality and Climate Division at the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, I have a, a few things to mention that I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for ANR to the extent that I can answer them I will and I will find answers for you if I can. Um, just in general, I think uh, you know my comments would largely align with um, the statements made by Laura and Rob um, from the Attorney General's office to the extent that um, uh, we agree, you know, with with the legal answers that they provided in terms of the legal mechanisms that are in the bill um, and the legal con uh, constructs that are within the bill. Um, A and R is in the process of kind of. Uh, getting feedback to House Energy and Technology Committee regarding the resources that would be needed to um, participate in the uh, Vermont Climate Council process that is established in this bill, and then also the rulemaking activity that would be required of the agency and then the implementation of the rulemaking. So that information is being compiled right now and, and will be provided to, to that committee. Um, we certainly are concerned that, um, that there would be uh, significant resources associated with the work that needs to be done um, in this bill, and, and we're, um, uh, as I said, determining what, what those needs will be. Um, in, in relation to the uh, attorney's fees section of the, the cause of action provision that you all have been discussing today, I think we are concerned, and this was alluded to somewhat by Rob and Laura, that um, the second cause of action in particular um, the you know the, the court is really asked to weigh in on um, a, a pretty subjective uh, question and, and consider that question and so we anticipate that attorneys fees associated with litigation and that cause of action would be fairly significant and we are we are concerned about um, the impact on the agency of that particular attorneys fees associated with that particular cause of action in the bill um, so those are just some general statements I wanted to make, but otherwise mostly, you know, aligned with, with what Rob and Laura had to say to answer questions. Um, so per Martin's question earlier, if we were going to look at um, language that would sort of further qualify in that second, co have, you, have you all thought about language that might um, help clarify the parameters around that second cause of action? In relation to the court's role, or? Yeah, in relation to, to the court's role, so they're sure. not sort of essentially setting policy for yeah, the state. We, is, that, um, is that something you're um, and, and we've been talking with, with the Attorney General's office okay. about that language, and I think we agree that you know a remand to ANR to determine how to mitigate, if that's what the court decides needs to happen, um, would be appropriate. 
Mm -hmm. So the so the litigation that you would perceive that would happen uh, under the subsection B um, would that that would revolve around whether the rule making or the rules were a substantial cause? Is that is that the concern? That that is the language in, in the bill. Uh, oh, it, it, regarding kind well, of the subjective nature yeah, of the question. Yeah, the, the concept of, of where this uh, big battle of experts and whatnot would be, because it seems right. to me that that um, the starting point is you get the inventory and you've either made it or not, and then of course you get into the subs was the rulemaking a substantial cause or not? I mean, how do you see that playing out? That that would be as complicated as you suggest. And it may be, I'm just curious, I just, uh, um, I think much like Rob and Laura said, it's really hard to predict what exactly that's gonna look like, but I think I would agree with you that it would require a lot of resources in terms of fact witnesses, expert witnesses, um, to answer you know that very subjective question. And so I think that's where our concern lies, is that it would be a very resource intensive matter um, that, uh, uh, that, that we would need to be engaged in. Is there a fix that you see for the day and is? Um, I think we would be in favor of um, uh, attorney's fees not being allowed um, for that, in that in, second for that cause of action. And if that, um, I'm assuming that the bill as introduced is a and is not supportive of it. Um, uh, my deputy secretary testified last week in House Energy and Technology, and I don't believe that he's taken a position. Position. So on you're the neutral bill. on it, and even if the changes are made, it's still a neutral position, as far as you know. Uh, I can't answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Do, do you have uh, any uh, viewpoints on whether there should be limiting language, as far as the, the any person? Uh, being able to bring this as opposed to any person with some contact to Vermont. I'm not sure what the limiting language would be, but do you have a, any viewpoint on that? Um, that's something that we're, we're still considering, um, and we, we haven't really reached a conclusion on whether or not that should be narrowed and, and to what extent. And then also if you have any uh, input on how you would see it play out as far as the taking prompt and effective action that showing would be for me and our, or just any comment on that. Prompt and effective action in yeah, relation to In the relation to getting more reasonable, uh, a reasonable period of time extension for completing the rulemaking or, or um, coming up with something that will meet the targets in the second type of cause of action. Um, I'm not prepared to answer that question right now, but I can certainly give that some thought and get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity um, to come and speak with you. My name is Jen Duggan, and I'm the director of Conservation Law Foundation. Prior to joining CLF, I was the general counsel for the Agency of Natural Resources. And I don't want to repeat a lot of what has been said, but I, I thought it, I wanted to sort of underscore a few points that I think are really important to the conversation. Um, one is that this cause of action section is really a backstop. You know, as the Attorney General said last week, um, you know, the best defense is compliance with the law. And so this cause of action section does not kick in unless ANR has not done the rules that are required by the statute, you know, or they, we haven't met those emission reduction requirements. So it's already sort of narrowed and limited. The other, um, thing to highlight is that the sponsors have been really thoughtful in terms of thinking through how to narrowly draft this accountability measure. Um, there is no uh, financial exposure in terms of penalties for the state. Um, there's not an ability for, um, you know, private citizens to create, you know, to get a windfall. Um, and the remedy is really limited to a remand back to the agency to do what they're required to do under the statute in the first instance. And reasonable fees 
um, to support that policy of making sure that there are resources available for government accountability. And the third um, concept is that you know we're we're here because this is really necessary. We need binding requirements and we need accountability. We are not on track to meet any of our climate commitments or the goals. The in Vermont, we have the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions um, as compared to our neighbors. Um, and we have an obligation to take action, to do our part for global climate change, but also to respond to the impacts that our communities are already feeling from climate change. Um, and we've talked a lot about how this bill addresses mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, but it also requires action to build resilience to make sure that our communities are prepared for climate change. And we know that even mitigation and all of these resilience measures bring about economic benefits for the state, public health benefits, environmental benefits. So this, you know, we've tried the goal route. Um, we've done a lot of small steps um, to address this crisis but those have not been sufficient. And so these binding requirements in this bill and an accountability framework that's narrowly tailored is really critical to make sure that we can meet this challenge. The, some of the, I'm just trying to, I don't want to repeat, you know, <coughs> what folks have said and I want to make sure that, um, you know, my testimony is as helpful as possible, but maybe one of the first um, places that I'll start, and then you know, please interrupt me with questions, is, is the question around standing and any person. Um, and you know, standing, Article Three standing, is actually a fairly high bar, particularly in the context of climate change. Um, and so, you know, your question about can some you know interest group in California bring suit and claim that because you know the state of Vermont hasn't done these mitigation rules and they're impacted by climate change, they somehow have standing to sue. There's an injury in fact um, component to it, but there's also causation, right? And so the, that individual in California may be able to say, I'm being impacted while, by wildfires. We know this is caused by um, you know climate change, but they also have to say, and it's this injury of mine is fairly traceable to the state of Vermont's failure to do rules to mitigate GHG emissions in Vermont. And so the, the standing um, inquiry is robust and I think will really limit who is able to get into the door mm -hmm. and the folks that will be able to show um, those types of injuries are more likely going to be closer um, tied to Vermont just by nature of that standing test. So I'll stop there in case folks have other questions on standing. Um, so I, yeah, I'm wondering if there is anything else that could be done in the language of findings, although findings don't necessarily make it all the way through this body um, or intent or if there's anywhere else, because frankly, that is my biggest concern about this bill, is that we're going to have this all laid out and people aren't going to be able to get into court because it is a very high bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we can't lower the bar very easily because it's constitution, the federal constitution. But do you have any input on if there's anything else that can be done or if you do think that there is a clear path uh, to establish Article Three standing, although it's a very high, high bar? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, um, Laura Murphy started to touch on this. There is case law with um, around procedural um, causes of action. So where a statute um, gives a citizen the right to challenge agency action that's been unlawfully withheld, so a failure to act in compliance with the statute, um, like in subsection A of this bill. Um, there is a somewhat relaxed standing requirement for redressability and immediacy. Um, and so recognizing that there is a lack of clarity about exactly what those rules might be when they're promulgated, um, the courts have found that there is standing um, where 
the rules um, are designed to address you know, the, the injury that the plaintiff is complaining about. So I think that's an important concept is that we are, there is case law that addresses the procedural injury of the, you know, the kind that a plaintiff would be alleging here. Is it clear enough in here that that's available? That is federal case law and Vermont courts have adopted, you know, the Article Three standing test and frequently look to federal case law when they are making decisions no, I, I about standing. I mean, is it clear enough in the bill that that avenue is, is available? I think so because okay. that is the words of, um, you know, the subsection A, where it's, you know, there's a cause of action when ANR fails to do a rulemaking by a deadline. Right. But how about subsection B? In subsection B, um, that is a little bit different, um, although I think that there are some similarities. You know, this is um, an interesting component of the bill. Um, um, but, I, but I think that um, the causation component, um, you know, this, as I mentioned in the opening, the when we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, there's global climate change. You know, that's one of the things that we're trying to get at here. But when we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we also have very tangible public health and environmental benefits that look more like traditional injuries under environmental law. And so I think that, you know, you can always include additional information and in the findings and the purpose of the statute to say that, you know, we are, this bill is intended to mitigate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and doing so, and, and also to get all of the benefits associated with doing that in terms of public health and environmental benefits. Um, so you can always include more robust language in the findings, um, you know, and a purpose uh, statement in, in the bill. Is that something that's being done upstairs? They, they are considering, you know, I was in there on Friday afternoon when they started discussing potential issues. Um, and so there was um, at least one of the committee members that had suggested a finding related to the public health benefits and the other benefits associated with. Yeah, I guess it's just whether we would weigh in on it. Yeah, this is just a, so given the barriers to the, the broad term of any person, is there any real reason not to restrict any person a little bit because as to avoid frivolous cases and reports of something that won't have any actual like, couldn't actually be brought forward with frivolous i think that there you know there already um are several deterrents to those to bringing those types of claims one is sort of the attorney ethical rules um, if you know you move forward with a case in bad faith or something that is frivolous or lacks any reasonable basis um, in law or fact um, you can be sanctioned um, and you can you know um, have ethical challenges going forward as a lawyer that's a really big deterrent for a lawyer um, and then the attorney fee provision, you know, in the statute um, also, you know, makes clear that if a plaintiff, you know, that a defendant, you know, may be entitled to fees if a plaintiff brings a case um, in bad faith or that's frivolous. So I think that there are already pretty significant deterrents um, from a plaintiff that would be acting in bad faith. So what's the argument for sorry, maybe? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, if that's a follow-up question. I'm yeah, it's just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Just the, what, what is the um, the argument for having that, that broad for, for having any person without any qualifiers? I think that if the intent is to hold is to ensure that there's accountability for government action that may impact an individual, you want to have that be accessible to them, and I think that. Um, you know, I would worry about trying to define 
who is in and who is out in terms of who is a Vermont citizen, you know, who is allowed to bring a case and who isn't. I think that because the Article III standing um, uh, test um, is, a, is a fairly high bar um, and is an important gatekeeper, um, it's not necessary and it would create, you know, other challenges if you try to start defining who is in and who is out in terms of protection of the statute. Um, I was going to ask just a broader question, which is, I know um, because I was involved in the earlier bill and this and this bill that part of, you know, part of what we were looking to is what states like Massachusetts did mm -hmm. and what the impact of having an enforcement mechanism was. And I know the Conservation Law Foundation was really involved in the lawsuit that came, mm -hmm. you know, helped bring the lawsuit that came forward in Massachusetts. And I wonder if you could just Talk about um, the value or impact that that enforcement mechanism had there for somewhat comparable legislation and, mm -hmm. and maybe how what we're proposing here kind of is similar or different from that, their experience. Sure. Um, there is no express cause of action provision in the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act. And so um, there was um, a significant sort of pathway through the courts to be to um, establish that, to get to an agreement on what the remedy would be. Um, and here, because there is an express cause of action section, there's a very clear path to court. There's certainty for both the agency, for the plaintiff. It reduces uncertainty around the litigation, you know, to a greater extent. Um, than there would be otherwise. Um, and it really, you know, this particular provision is really narrowly tailored to focus on making sure that, you know, the, there is accountability um, and that ANR does what they are required to do under statute and nothing more. Um, and I think that, you know, without that, there is, without a clear procedural pathway, without that, mm -hmm. without that certainty around remedy, um, there is more to, um, you know, to discuss with a judge, mm -hmm. um, and there's there's just lack of clarity there. So I, I think that this sort of gives certainty to everybody about what the rights are and what the remedy is. And can you tell us just in the Massachusetts case a little bit about what the remedy was there and how that may or may not happen. You know, it's been a long time since okay. I looked at the specifics, um, and I'd be happy to get you a, a really detailed summary of that. Um, but, but basically, you know, there is an order, there was an order to do, to implement the GWSA, mm -hmm. um, their GWSA. Yeah. Um, but I can get you more specifics okay. on exactly what yeah. that order yeah. entailed. Great. Um, when you brought this or when the Conservation Law Foundation... Yep, I wasn't there, so I wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know if it was under a similar provision to the, the, the Section 2 cause of action, or do you, do you have any idea? What? My understanding was it, it was under the um, Massachusetts um, Administrative Procedures Act or their Declaratory Judgment Act, and not there was not an express cause of action in their Global Warming Solutions Act. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, I, I guess it's the, the history of appropriations committee for me. I'm having a hard time um, getting my head around something that I don't know the cost of and, and mm -hmm. voting to move that forward without even yeah. a rough idea of what that costs in the... Um, yeah. Could you comment on, on ANR's concern about removing that uh, attorney's fees from the second cause of action? Sure. And I, and just... And thinking through um, potential costs, it's very hard to put a number on that. But you know, under subsection A, that case really looks like motions practice. So people are filing a brief papers that say they either did or did not meet that deadline. Um, so that's going to be really limited in terms of the time for both parties. Um, for B, just as a reminder, um, there, um, this will come into play three times between right. now and 2050. Right. So this is not something that is 
you know, accessible at any moment in time. It really is tied to the production of the emissions inventory and the reduction requirements, which are 2025, um, 2030, and, and 2050. And so th that sort of limits it right there. Um, Except and, if you're sitting upstairs in the year where that bill hits. Y yes, but yeah. just in terms of thinking through over the next 50 years and the amount of money that the state m might be subject to. Um, the other, um, you know, thing to note is that this is all going to be based on what the rules did or didn't do. And as part of this um, bill and as part of the Administrative Procedures Act, um, the agency is required to develop robust um, records in terms of why they're doing the bill, how it achieves greenhouse gas emission reductions. So all of this work, a lot of this work has to happen as they're doing the rulemakings, as part of the rulemaking process. The other sort of way that this is limited um, in terms of financial exposure is that the remedy in this particular case directs the agency to go back and do more rules. And a big um, component of time in a trial or litigation in many cases is a sort of a dispute about what the appropriate remedy Damages. is. Yeah. And so that's just off the table. Mm -hmm. And so I can't, you know, come up with a concrete number for you, but I, I hope that's helpful in terms of this is how this is, um, you know, limited in many ways. Do you know if the Conservation Law Foundation was able to recover attorney's fees when the Massachusetts suit was brought? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm happy to find out. Because yeah. I, I agree with the access to justice. You want to make sure yeah. that people can do it. Um, can bring an action, um, but at the same time, I, I want to. I, I need someone to tell me something that's yeah, I'll, more concrete. I'll I'll give some thought in terms of how we might be able to provide some information about costs. Um, you know what I. The other point I wanted to touch on is is and you you know sort of mentioned this is this important policy rationale for allowing you know, for fees, you know, there's a pretty significant differential in terms of, pow you know, mm -hmm. the balance of power between citizens and government. And so this really attempts to address that imbalance of power um, while creating, um, you know, the, the, while balancing against, you know, frivolous or bad faith lawsuits, there is a deterrent built in here. Mm -hmm. um, Um, so I, I want to make sure I understood uh, for the uh, subsection B, the substantial cause of failure, that component, uh, it's your understanding as well that it's just a remand, straight remand that we're intending here. And, and if, you know, I won't have a comment on language that we don't have yet, but, but you know, we'll certainly, when we see language that hopefully tightens that and makes it clearer. Yeah, and I think that it's important to just remember that you know the separation of powers doctrine applies and judges are not allowed to engage in you know legislative um, making or impl you know implementation of, of laws and so they're in terms of the roles of the legislature and the executive branch and so there is some um, discretion that judges have in terms of remanding for rulemaking you know they may you know they may give guidance and information to say the rules were deficient because the transportation sector you know didn't meet x y and z um you know that's different from saying you must regulate these things in the transportation sector right so there is a there's a little bit of discretion in terms of what guidance they give back to the agency but the further they drift towards dictating the substance of a rule, there is a higher risk of being, um, you know, overturned on an on appeal. They're in sort of dangerous territory the closer they get to actual rulemaking. <coughs> Continue on if you're heading. Yeah. Just trying to see if there's anything else I wanted to um, to to touch on. Um, I, 
I think the other thing came up that I think we've kind of talked through it, but um, you know, it's my, in terms of subsection B, you know, it's my understanding and it is the way that I read um, the bill is that there is, um, it is not intended to put ANR on the hook where things outside of their control have occurred, you know, and are the reason why we have not met, you know, the emissions reduction. So if um, this plan will require a mix of legislative and appropriation and regulatory strategies, um, if the legislative component of that is 90% of the emissions reductions, ANR does the rules, um, but the legislature doesn't pass new laws to get there. ANR is able to point to that and say, you know, our rulemaking is not a substantial cause of the reason why we didn't achieve these reductions. And so I think um, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that that's the way that I read it um, and, and understand that. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So we are adjourned. Can we discuss for just a few minutes as far as what else we need?